Introducing the new DigiCert as the leading provider of high assurance SSL, TLS, and PKI certificates, DigiCert is all about improving security across the web and IoT. DigiCert is committed to helping customers and partners successfully deploy identity, authentication, and encryption solutions. They'll even help you figure out which certificate you need to secure your web domains, apps, devices, and more. Check out the Cert Wizard tool under the SSL tab on digicert.com. The average time between being hacked and realizing you've been hacked is one year. Can you afford to let an intruder roam your network for that long? Can your company weather the fallout when this comes to light? Black Hills Information Security can find the bad guys in your network and train you to do it yourself. Email consulting at blackhillsinfosec.com to find out how a hunt teaming engagement can help you find a persistent threat in your network. Signal Sciences is the industry's first web protection platform that works in any cloud, any container, any platform as a service, and any modern application architecture. The Signal Sciences web protection platform can be deployed in next generation WAF, RASP, or reverse proxy modes, giving customers ultimate flexibility and coverage. Protect your web applications with Signal Sciences web protection platform. Signal Sciences, protecting applications, connecting teams. For more information, check them out at signalsciences.com forward slash PSW. Welcome back, everyone, to, hey, there I am, to Paul Security <laughs> Weekly. This is our technical segment for this evening. Larry, you've got a creative way, I yes. think, <laughs> yes. that you would like to give away. Is it two or one ticket? Two tickets or one? Piece the hell out of me. Sam, is it one? One? Two, two tickets, tickets to B-Sides Rhode Island. So you can bring yourself and a guest. Nice. Nice. So you're giving away two tickets to B-Sides Rhode Island. The so social so what did engineering. I say? B-Sides Rhode Island? Yeah. 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 It's because Patrick Laverty is the organizer to SE Rhode Island, and, and Patrick and I were also the organizers to B-Sides, B-Sides. Rhode Island. Secure Social Engineering Rhode Island. SE-RI.org yes. to learn more. Yes. Uh, so what's the deadline for submissions? For uh, the... C- uh, for, no, for the the, con- the two ticket giveaway. To buy tickets? No, or the no. ticket giveaway. So the, the ticket, ticket giveaway. Oh, our own internal ticket giveaway contest. Yes. yes. I would say two weeks. Two weeks from now. So that would be what? June 1st. June 1st. Roughly, right? Like so, beginning of June. Yeah. If you want to win tickets, yeah. the best judged by the Security Weekly staff... Yeah. We're going to have like an official vote, like a virtual vote. We're all going to get in like a virtual vote. A Slack now, channel. Now, read it. Now, following instructions is important. Uh-oh. Send your entries to PSW at securityweekly.com. Yep. Okay. I like this P- so far. PSW at securityweekly.com. I'm nervous what's going to come the next. The best <laughs> meme featuring Paul and Larry. Wow, it's a Fo- Photoshop contest. Photoshopping oh. is okay, or pictures you find on the internet. It's okay if we see the pixels. You know, don't Tokyo, worry about your Photoshop yeah, skills. Right, you can but use the them as be- Microsoft Paint if you wanted yep. to. In the, fact, I encourage that. The best meme, that scores points with me if you use it as paint. Meme of Paul and Larry. That's awesome. Security. Relevance. I like that because you know you're gonna. We're all gonna use those in our presentations now. Yes, <laughs> yes we are. <laughs> I would like to say we retain full rights to use those in our presentations. We will give credit, but we will uh, use those in our, our uh, presentations. Absolutely. So, so, so by June first, good job. PSW at securityweekly.com. The best memes featuring both Paul and Larry. That's so beautiful in so many ways, Larry. <laughs> it gives us entertainment. It gives us content. I'm, I'm all moist. <laughs> what? What? <laughs> there, wow. There's meme Larry, number one. Not any of the hosts. Uh, I think it's time to change the depends, uh, Doug. If that's, so, yeah, that's usually the, that's usually the case of, of the moist. So, niceness. hey, this is our technical segment uh, <laughs> called configuring your own travel router, including uh, setting up OpenVPN and uh, my recent uh, experiences. So I do have slides. Can we put my... My slides up and, and kind of go back and forth between me and my slides. Hey, there's my slide. So I put together some slides for this technical segment at the low. Feature, s- featuring memes. Featuring memes, yes. And could be your meme. So I guess the first question is like, why do you need a travel router? And I, I kind of like, you've, we talked about these actually early on with Josh Wright years mm-hmm. ago about how you could use. Uh, some access points from major manufacturers as essentially a travel router, and it would automatically VPN back you, uh, backhaul you to yep. your own network. I'm like, that's really cool. Um, so recently, we were at a conference. It came up with just one of these use cases. So why do you need a travel router? Um, one case is you don't want to configure a VPN client on every single one of your devices. So let's say you're traveling for work or you're going to a security conference. You want to be security conscious. You've got a tablet. You've got a phone. And you've got a laptop. If you have a VPN provider, 
whether that's VPNing you back to your company, or in this case, I'm using OpenVPN using a public service to uh, encrypt my traffic uh, to the provider and then be able to browse the web. I don't want to have to configure and maintain an uh, OpenVPN instance on my Android phone, another one on my Android tablet, and then one on my Linux laptop. I want to just have all those three devices, and when I connect, consolidate that one connection inside of a travel router. It gives me flexibility to use whatever devices I want without having to maintain a client on each of them. The other thing is you want an encrypted tunnel when you're using someone else's network. Mm -hmm. um, you know, some of, <coughs> in our particular use case, it was actually our streaming server, I was very concerned that the data that we would send over our streaming server, the authentication token that we use to authenticate to our streaming provider uh -huh. to say, we're broadcasting on Security Weekly's channel on YouTube, Facebook, or wherever we're streaming. Uh, I was concerned someone would intercept that because with that, you couldn't completely take over someone's account likely, but you could definitely take control of the streaming, which means if you wanted to stream Larry's poop for three hours, you, you could. could do that. And yep. like this, this could go wrong. <laughs> Remember, this could go horribly wrong. <laughs> yeah, remember that time when we used to use HTTP on our wiki and someone logged into it yes, at CCDC? Yes, that happened to us. That was another yep. security incident uh, yep. that happened, yes. Uh, so I want an encrypted tunnel when we're doing anything at a conference, especially, or when you're traveling. Um, so the other thing is you have devices that have no monitor, mouse, or keyboard in which you use to fill out a CAPTCHA uh, or enter, you know, the even just click OK on a Wi-Fi, like, pop-up box uh, that I'm going to use the hotel Wi-Fi or I'm plugged into Ethernet and that yet still requires some kind of knack or something on the other side that lets me accept something that like, yes, I accept your policies or log in or whatever the case may be. You may not have that on your devices. I'm sure if you have a phone, a tablet, or a laptop, you do, but what if you have some kind of streaming server like we had or some other kind of device that you want to plug in and work with when you're on a pen test, Larry, right? You probably have lots of you. are like, I want to update firmware on this whatever uh -huh. weird embedded system and I can't just plug it into the hotel network because it doesn't have a, a mouse or keyboard or yep. a monitor on it. So I liked it for that. Again, the driver for this, the reason I ordered these was uh, we're actually going to, we started live streaming for uh, maybe the first time. We've done some live streaming before, mostly just audio. This is the first time I think we've live streamed video from a conference was at Source Boston last week. So, and it was a learning experience. It was a learning experience. I learned that hotel IT staff <laughs> at certain hotels are completely useless. <laughs> um, and so we couldn't get access to the Ethernet, and their Wi-Fi had uh, you know, some kind of CAPTCHA on it, and so uh, hence the solution uh, that we have. So uh, wh what do you buy? And uh, thankfully, uh, our friend Mark, who visits here in studio, uh, is a listener of the show and a fan of the show and visits us in studio, uh, said, hey, Paul, I got one of these devices. He's like, you could totally benefit from using one of these devices. And I'm like, all right, well, what is that? I took a picture you know, of the label to get the model number. Mm -hmm. And so the question was, well, what do you buy, Paul? Um, so I bought this. It's GLINet yep. is the, comp yep. the company that rebrand. I'm sure it's, it's a Chinese thing, right? Yeah, like yeah. it's a Chinese company. That hmm. I'm sure you could probably find a different Chinese company that's With selling the, the exact stuff. same hardware. Yep. Go, and the, go Google search for GLI or Amazon for yeah. GLI. GLI dot, sorry, GL dot INET. Yeah. Yes. And yeah, you'll find... You'll find a hundred of them. Yeah. I mean, yeah, there's and there's, tons all, of there's different many, models, many different right. like, configurations and types and models of them, sure. too. And, and you can get unbranded ones that are the same chipset. Same chipset, right. Yeah, exactly. it's just now they're not called gl.inet. They're, they're just like called Endu or Yahoo or yeah, exactly, yeah. <laughs> Wahoo or, yes. <laughs> so you can see the pictures of, uh, of the device there. It's got my, uh, my 4G uh, AT&T LTE modem on it. And uh, this is a gl.inet gl-ar300m. Uh, is the device that I chose. Again, as we said, there's tons of different options for you uh, in even just GL, INET, let alone the yep. other, like, not, like other, I wouldn't even call them knockoffs. They're like other brands mm -hmm. that They're are probably distributing the same, the same hardware. They're the same motherboard with right. just a different case. And, and like I say, you can get that motherboard with or that board with just about any kind of soldered on configuration from USBs. To, sure. I didn't see one with HDMI on it, but you could probably find probably. one somewhere. Yep. Uh, yeah, there's so another model with external antenna is the point is yeah. the ones I bought were thirty-two dollars, right? Yep. So I bought two of them. The, like, one, the ones that I bought recently were the GLI Net uh, GLAR one hundred and fifty. Mm -hmm. 
um, mm -hmm. because I didn't care whether they had like AC or any of that stuff. I, slow was fine, right? Because I'm typically real limited by the upstream network. Yep. Um, and those were fine, and those were twenty four ninety nine. There you go. And they're the same form factor. And I think the one with the external antennas is like forty five or fifty bucks. I saw yep. one of those for thirty nine this afternoon. I think they had two. Nice. They had two external antenna loads on it, so that were actually pre built into it. So that was the yeah. point is shop around, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. When the, you're looking the, at this hardware, they, uh, the AR one fifty twenty four ninety nine with the internal twenty six dollars with external yeah yeah uh so this is a, a qualcomm uh processor uh on here it's the qca9531 650 megahertz uh processor it has 128 megs of ddr2 ram 16 megs of storage plus you can upgrade that to 128 nan dual flash if you like typically that upgrade was similar to your antenna upgrade there larry mm -hmm. like it was a, like an extra five bucks and you get yeah. 128 megs of flash um, I mean, if you're just using it for this purpose, you probably don't even need any more storage on it, right? The only good reason to get extra flash on these things is because later, if you want to upgrade... And install you, packages and you stuff. You want to install yeah. packages, or even later, there's a new firmware, or mm -hmm. there's some other firmware that you haven't thought about yet that you want to put on there later. Yep. The more flash you have, the more likely you'll be able to get that. I mean, if it's you're paying $50 for that, then that's not a good deal. But if you're paying 5 bucks to upgrade the flash, I would upgrade the flash Absolutely. anytime. Um, so uh, it has you know Wi-Fi on it, as well as two Ethernets. Um, and a USB port on it, which is awesome. So, uh, and it's really low power. Now, they do say when you power it that uh, if you're going to use an external USB, uh, like 4G LTE modem, that you should have at least a 5 volt 2 amp. Did I get that right? Like 5 volt 2 amp huh? power supply uh, or greater to power the device because yeah. that obviously that USB is drawing yep. uh, a lot of power. So, and it powers over a regular USB to, to micro USB. Um, so I powered it off my laptop at first, and then when I had my 4G modem on, I actually had a 12 volt, uh, 2 amp uh, output on my USB hub that's powered. So I plugged it into that, and it was fine. Um, so, next slide. Uh, so then, uh, once we've selected our hardware, the hmm. next slide is how. Cool. How do we uh, actually configure oh. this piece? Now, <laughs> it comes with its own version of um, OpenWare. You can put whatever firmware on there. In fact, on the manufacturer's website, they've got different options. If you want to put your own OpenWRT on there, mm -hmm. uh, I would do that. Actually, I would probably recommend it because these devices come from China. One of the things I noticed was like that there was a package called like China DNS, and I think by default your DNS yep. traffic was being routed to China. Like there's weird when you buy cameras or routers or any of this gear that comes branded directly from China, they typically have, in my experience, some kind of link back to the manufacturer mm -hmm. or something. Like your NTP servers might be pointing there or something weird. So it's best to wipe all that stuff out. I think um, they just do some it. of it just to test it. I think they blow a yeah. they blow an image onto stuff to test it, and then they just leave it on there. Hey, and, it worked. And it, and yeah, and, and suddenly you're connected back to the mainland. Sure. Um, so this Nicole. particular uh, device you can see in the, the diagram, this is the initial interface, um, and I'll show you how to get to the advanced interface as well, because this one is very basic uh, and tries to be user-friendly, but really isn't, but just tries to be basic about it. There is a, a toggle switch that you can move from left to right, and in the software you can configure what that does. You can flip the mode between uh, like a bridge or a Wi-Fi hotspot, or they give you some options to program that button. Of course, when Larry and I wrote the book on WRT54G routers, mm -hmm. We realized that any button in any light was programmable right, right through the firmware. It was yep. very easy to write a, a shell script that would yep. toggle all, that stuff, all and that's G all. All GPIO, do. and you, yeah, you mm -hmm. could just write a uh, with OpenWare. You could just write a script to uh, intercept any of those uh, GPIO toggles and do whatever you want. Right. <clears throat> um, so that's the initial uh, <coughs> interface for it. Wow, that's uh, what it looks again. like. Yeah. I've never used the web interface on them because uh, I have Lucy not installed on mine. Yes. So it has so no web interface, so version. I used SSH. Yeah. Well, actually use Telnet first. And then SSH, like in traditional open work. Yeah. yeah. So obviously the first thing to do is to set your own SSID and password on it uh, for clients, which you definitely want to do as your first step uh, in locking it down. Don't Obviously don't leave the default. It does not but ask you for a default password. You have to enter a password mm -hmm. when you first configure it. But the default is conveniently written on the bottom, so you don't forget it. It is. It is. So if you need to reset, I haven't played with the reset. There is a reset button on it as well. I haven't played around with the reset button. I'm assuming if you hold it in for five seconds, 
<clears throat> which is another trappable event in in open where it makes it easy to do that it probably just reconverts uh re uh puts on there the default factory settings which from my memory now is based on nvram settings right it'll yep, read yes. the nvram and then uh rebuild everything and if you and if you mess with those <coughs> traps of that button press be careful because if you disable that you can fry yourself and then you just brick it of course you're out 25 bucks so it's right. like ooh <laughs> you hope it's got a a feature in the bios that lets you tftp new firmware yeah if if it will it if you can get if, into if it if that's can, that has to be configured though um yep. so uh I'll upgrade firmware that's important. I'm kind of leery. I, I I don't know. I might stick with this firm. I might not because this comes from a Chinese company. I'm a, a little <laughs> kind of a little scared about uh, doing that. But inside the firmware, you can just go like check for new firmware. If there's a new version from this GL.inet manufacturer, get new firmware. So I upgraded the firmware on mine because especially when you're working with uh, 3G, 4G LTE modems, if you bought a new one like I did from AT&T for $7 a month, they give you the latest version. Right. Mm -hmm. But like all this hardware that you plug it into needs to have like the latest drivers and know how to talk to it. So that was one, uh, other than security, a good reason to update firmware. Our live streamer is an embedded system that we plugged my uh, new modem into it and it wasn't recognizing it. Mm. And we had to do a firmware upgrade, upgrade from the company. Now, maybe to talk about in the next segment, this company makes you file a support request, plug your device into the internet, and does the firmware update for you, and does not give you access to the firmware, Ooh. which of course begs the question, what are they hiding? In right. this case, uh. for this device manufacturer, you can see all of the firmware, get all of the firmware, and put your own firmware on it if you don't trust the firmware from this manufacturer. So you can Wireshark the update. That's exactly what I said to Mark when he did it. I'm like, let's do it again. And Wireshark so the update. And, Wireshark and you've got the update, update and you can see got what the they firmware did. firmware and mm -hmm. probably run strings on the firmware and go, oh, hey, look, a backdoor. Yeah. Hey, look open at source. That. Yep. <laughs> uh, so you can, in the upper right-hand corner, you can kind of see advanced settings. When you click advanced settings, you get the Lucy uh, interface in uh -huh. OpenWRT. Okay. So it's really just OpenWRT running under the yeah. covers. They give you the facility to access that if you want to poke through, if you're more comfortable with OpenWRT. Uh, I did just pop in there and take a look at you know the kernel version. And actually, the OpenWRT has an awesome interface uh, for monitoring performance on it. Mm -hmm. So it gives you like CPU and resource utilization. Um, one of my tests I want to do is like run some traffic through it and see what the uh, CPU utilization is on it and see what my bottleneck might be. Typically, as Larry said, your bottleneck's probably going to be your upload Upstream. speed, yep. especially if you're using a 4G modem. Or I got about hotel. one meg one meg down, one meg up on my my 4G uh, LTE USB modem. Yep. It's, uh, better, it's better than Josh gets in Middletown. Well, and, and be be careful when you do throughput tests on these kind of devices that you don't get too nasty with them. Because like Paul keeps saying, the upload, or, or Larry was saying, the upload's mm. going to be the big bottleneck. And I've seen people do a lot of throughput tests on these things, and they go, oh, it's not very fast. And you go, yeah, but what you're going to connect it to is not very fast either. And and so just, just I mean, I know they said that, but just as a caution. Reiterate. My my ping time went from like 32 milliseconds to 110 when I applied the VPN, which I'll talk about next as well. So it's a good thing to run a speed test if you're late. And so in our again, our application was to use our streaming device securely from conferences when we go to conferences, it's places like Black Hat and DEF CON, so security <laughs> is absolutely important and an, a factor in what we use and not even trump speed in those environments, right? But the streaming service we use has their own proprietary protocol that goes to their servers, and then their servers cache it and then send it out to YouTube or Facebook or wherever you're streaming. So for us, I'm like, Mark, the latency is like, you know, three or four times what it should be if we run yeah. a VPN over it, or maybe we use a 4G modem, and it's got some latency and bandwidth issues, but as long as we can make a solid connection to their server, they're going to cache it, and if our live stream right. lags by five minutes, like Mark's comment was, yeah, they won't know the difference. <laughs> like, if you're watching it live, you don't know, right? Yeah, it's like <laughs> Unless you're on the phone with someone who's there, right? Or yep. whatever, but... You're watching it with a friend. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh my God! Did you see what oh Paul my God, did you're on now? TV. Look at you! Yeah. You can see up his kilt. <laughs> <laughs> so I configured uh, an OpenVPN client. I was kind of curious when I got this device what I needed to configure for OpenVPN. I'm like, do I need to set up my own server? Can you use a publicly available service? Turns out you can use a publicly available service or set up your own OpenVPN server, which I have in the past. For the purposes of this segment, I'm using OpenVPN. Uh, they were actually a former sponsor of Security Weekly. 
and I've met the the founder and CTO of that company. So I feel like since I talked to people at that company, I felt like I could trust them more so yeah. than any other any other uh, VPN company, which can get kind of shady, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so I went the least shady one, in my opinion, of them all, solely because I've talked to uh, the founders and people that work there. So uh, I configured uh, Pro XPN, uh, and the configuration was kind of weird in two ways, which reminds me, when you do the USB 4G modem, like I, I went through all the settings and it still wasn't connecting and then I unplugged the modem and I plugged it back in and like magically it connected. So like whatever, it's a little buggy in that respect. Yeah. The other bugs were... Service networking restart. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's, that's exactly what it is, right? Um, so with the VPN though, like I would upload my certificates as three, you know, the CA, uh, the client secret and the client key and the client certificate and the open VPN file all need to be uploaded to your uh, open WRT router or this yep. GLO.inet, right? And it would give me all kinds of weird errors. Like sometimes it would be like, oh, I can't find the certificates because they're config files looking for in the SSL directory. So then you put them in the SSL directory and your initial upload fails. And you're like, so I'll take them out of the SSL directory and then reconfigure. Like there's a lot of like hoops I had to go through uh, to get it to work. Once it did work, then the first server it connected to wouldn't connect. <laughs> So I'll, I'll talk about that. So anyway, that's the configuration screen in which you do that. The interface for this is, is really wonky. Like I said, it took me a bunch of tries to get like what I felt was right for the configuration. And then you have to <coughs> click that little enable checkbox uh, and then click apply. And that's how you make it connect to the VPN. It was mm. kind of wonky like that. Um, so anyway, I Yay, did it eventually. Yeah, exactly. Get it connected. <laughs> but so my first problem or one of my problems was uh, it would make a connection to ProXPN servers and it would just, in a loop, it would just time out. Because in that config file, it tells it to retry uh, over, and you know, over and over again. Yep. So I went to, I dug in all the links. Uh, the link to this presentation slides uh, is in the show notes, wiki.securityweekly.com. And uh, at the end of this presentation is all the links to all the resources I found when I did this little project. So... I went to ProXPN's site, I dug around in their knowledge base, and I found this screen right here, which is basically for Android devices, but is an OVPN file for all of these different destinations. And they list out all their cities and countries mm. that they connect to. So I chose New York via TCP. And in that OVPN file is the clear text of all your certificate files, in addition to your configuration, which is bouncing between three servers in right. New York on three different ports. I'm like, let me try that configuration. That did eventually work. And I'll, I'll give you the link to that if you're using ProXPN. This is the instructions. You have to download from ProXPN, and it differs for your VPN provider. They have instructions on the gl.inet website. You download, like in this case, the Mac version. You unzip the Mac version of their VPN client, and you get the certificates in the OVPN file from there you put that in your own zip file and then upload that zip file to the router so the process was like i said i had to kind of it mess. wasn't cut and dried no i had to mess with all the settings along the way um that in case you wanted as a reference is a configuration file that worked for me uh you can see those remote and then an ip address in a port uh at the top there and then about three quarters of the way down, you'll see the CA, the cert, and the key. Uh, so I had to add that into the configuration file that they sent me. Because on Android, I guess they put it all in one file. This uh, open Requires wanted separate. it all separate. Yeah. So that's you can reference my uh, configuration file there. So the resources, which is really important. The Amazon link to go by the router, the documentation for the router, the product page for the router are all there. Um, on ProXPN, there's a list of sites and configuration files. The link to that is in there. And then there's a link on gl-inet.com on how to configure OpenVPN on your device. All of the websites that I referenced uh, are in uh, my slides for this tech segment. And my plug at the end is I will be at se-ri.org. Uh, that's the website. I will be at se-ri, the conference, yep. uh, giving a presentation uh, and if you, what was the contest? I already remind them of that. You need to send a meme of both Paul, of both Paul and I to PSW at securityweekly.com by June 1st. There you go. Judged by the Security Weekly staff. And we will pick two, I guess two winners, right? Because we had two tickets. Well, no. The top well, two? You or are we going to give two tickets to one person? Yeah, two tickets to one person. Okay. We're, Doug says we're giving two tickets to one person so you can bring yourself 
and your significant and, other. Because who and, doesn't want to go to a and, social engineering and, and conference? If, uh, <laughs> if, if you win... It's and a you, hot date. If you win and you can only go by yourself, you can elect to say, I'd like to give the second ticket to number two. Sure. That's right. Or, you know, if you decide to take your significant other, we'll give you a gift basket complete with wine and cheese and grapes. And condoms. <laughs> I knew you were going to go there. I was just teeing that up for you. That was yep. like a lob. I lobbed it right in the strike zone, and Larry hit the home and, run. And to quote my good friend Joshua Wright, 47 boxes of dog biscuits and a tube of KY. <laughs> oh. Dog biscuits. All right, I'm out. Why is <laughs> Why dog biscuit? You Dear know what? God. We'll talk that, about that, that. And that is why. We will talk about that during the break as we end the segment and come back on the security news for this week. Stay tuned.